uh, Boston Children's, Milwaukee, and Philadelphia have, uh, so there are four children's hospitals, I think, represented one way or another in the group five. Who'd I miss? Janet Wise Children's Hospital. Janet Wise Children's Hospital. Okay. And probably others. And so it's a different world for us. Uh, the, my CEO is connecting with other children's hospitals in fear that the new rationed healthcare system may not leave a place for specialized children's hospitals like we've had in the past. Um, and of course, I think that center picture is one of Mark at a younger age, or a clone, oh, the other, huh? <laughs> ready to uh, run a meeting. And so uh, we see a lot of children. This is our city here on the left and our children's hospital on the right, um, nestled in the middle eastern, middle part of the eastern part of the country. <laughs> We have about uh, 1.1 million patient visits and have see 70,000 new patients a year. We have about 13 uh, outpa outreach, uh, outpatient clinics. We have 5,000 patients in our neonatal intensive care units spread around the various sites. Locally, we do 33,000 surgeries. We've done 500 liver transplants. So we do 3,500 adeno adenoidectomies a year. We have some uh, complicated surgical procedures that people come from all over the world for. And um, thanks to a uh, endowment from, uh, the, uh, from the, family, the Proctor family of Proctor & Gamble, which is located in Cincinnati, instead of building a building, an endowment was started, and that has grown to about $1.5, $1.8 billion for Children's Hospital, which has made a big difference. We have an annual income from billing and everything else of about $1.4 billion. And we have an NIH uh, uh, income about $107 million a year. And we have not fallen off the fiscal cliff yet, but I expect like everybody else, it's just a moment before uh, the, physical, the physical discipline hits everyone. We have an Epic Electronic Medical Record and a Cerner Lab Record. Uh, and. Uh, we, the institution has the sense that we are behind and maybe kind of typical for a large referral center uh, that uh, we have not brought the genomic uh, diagnostics and uh, technologies to our patient care environment. As a consequence, uh, I and the chief of uh, human genetics, um, Greg Grabowski, have been assigned the duty of trying to help generate a uh, plan uh, for the leadership that will help accelerate our progress. So at the moment, we do individual gene sequencing. We do a lot of infectious disease work. We have a very nice cytogenetics lab, do about 2,000 cytogenetic studies a year, and have an active pharmacogenomics program that I'll talk about. Um, we are converting to targeted gene sequencing and trying to implement whole genome sequencing. And we are bracing ourselves for uh, diagnostic testing and evaluation that, that uh, brings to the table gene expression, DNA sensitivity, whole genome sequencing, methylation, histone marks, and uh, 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 the uh, chromosome immunoprecipitation testing. And I'm surprised at this meeting that there's, no, there's, almost, there's been no discussion of these new technologies to speak of, and we're completely focused on uh, the DNA sequencing results. And these, uh, I expect that, uh, that if you think the world is complicated now, wait until these things come to the clinic uh, and uh, what they will bring uh, will be whole new entire genome analyses that generate the same kind of uh, problems that we're dealing with whole genome sequencing, but in what, like string theory, 11 dimensions or something? So just multiply with the problems we have with the informatics and everything else by at least an order of magnitude and maybe more. Anyway, so in the human genetics, we bill about $11 million and collect about seven, and uh, about the same ratio, we have about a 60% uh, return. We're sending out, and you know, this is a new assignment for me, so I'm not really certain exactly what tests are being sent away but our pathology department is sending out about $2 million worth of work. 
um, that is deemed to be genomic in origin. Um, and, and so at this point, I'll talk a little bit about our, our pharmacogenomics testing, which has been something that is clinically used to a great extent in our facility, uh, largely by the psychiatrists and psych uh, because of uh, the difficulty they have. And so there's some special issues about how that's happening and weaknesses and strengths of that uh, program that we plan to work on. So um, we have 36 drugs that are actively being used and commonly used that uh, uh, we look at uh, CYB2D6 and CYB2C19 testing and then uh, bring this back to the patient record with the test performed, the, the genotype, the predicted phenotype, whether the patient's predicted to be a poor metabolizer, an intermediate metabolizer, an excellent or an ultra metabolizer. And then dosing recommendations. And as you can see on these graphs, the dosing recommendations change uh, based upon what the genotype is. Amipramine's at one end, which is extraordinarily different. And uh, these others are down here where it doesn't make as much difference. The testing limitation, uh, sources of supplemental information, and then an invitation to get a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a genetic consult from the pharmacogenomics service. So this is the website for the uh, genetic pharmacology service. And uh, of course, when they talk to our clinicians, they're interested in getting the consults. So this, this shows up. When you order one of these drugs, a panel appears in the, um, in the electronic medical record to invite the uh, pharmacogenetic testing and whether or not a consult is desired. And so those things are automatic. Um, it's done by drug name. There's about a two business day turnaround, which turns out to be really important. And so the, 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 uh, there's a large uh, uh, psychiatric admission service. Maybe I think it's about 15% of our admissions are psychiatric, something like that. Uh, and uh, the, dosing, the, the physician makes a decision about the initial uh, dose for the drug, and then the, the test comes back and altered or, or not, according to the physician. We've been trying to fund a, uh, an outcomes research project on this, uh, this, but have so far not succeeded. And uh, then the consultation and other educational materials are available. We've done this uh, on more than 8,000 uh, uh, patients and have done 1,700 this past year and have quite a large database mainly in the psychiatry services and some with uh, some of the autistic uh, patients are tested. Uh, physicians have different uh, desires for getting this test done. Some of them want uh, to understand the genetics and have a sophisticated idea about what's happening. Others just want a drug recommendation and some want the, uh, the, the panel to cover what the potential drugs might be. So there's not much data to show that this is really dramat a dramatically useful uh, uh, thing to do. But it's now embedded in our practice in a way that our physicians and patients seem to be happy with. Um, one of the measures is this behavioral intervention score. And we can, uh, in these 300 patients with uh, various things, mood disorders being the most common and anxiety disorders being next, um, we can correlate the um, phenotype with the number of uh, behavioral intervention score changes, uh, uh, problems that the patient has in that initial period. And so th this, these are the patients on drugs that uh, are dependent upon CYB2D6 and CYB2C19. And uh, the next slide shows uh, another group of patients that are not uh, using these kinds of drugs. Uh, that are dependent on these particular, this particular route of metabolism. And so we have some evidence that it makes a difference. Uh, we'd like to see outcome data, but we don't have that. Uh, we are doing uh, the neuropsychiatric drugs, some of the uh, uh, codeine and related drugs, um, azathioprine and uh, warfarin, and um, we have the capacity to do the drugs that are not pediatric, 
but are very popular among our adult hospital uh, colleagues. And then we're going to make an effort to bring the immunosuppressive drugs, uh, tacrolimus in particular, uh, and uh, the mycophenolates, al uh, along with the other morphine-like drugs and variconazole, into the picture in uh, the coming year. Um, and we'd just like to emphasize that when we, here's an example of using tacrolimus, that we have three different uh, cell types represented here, and each of these cell types has a different uh, spectrum of, uh, of molecules that influence the consequence of having the drug in that tissue, and so it makes it fairly complicated. We uh, hope to bring uh, to the neuropsychiatric panel an additional set of uh, genetic testing that will be made available to the clinic in the coming year and expanding this neuropsychiatric panel. Whoops. Um, and then we have decision support tools that help uh, make this, integrate this into the medical record, which uh, are, makes it a little bit easier to deal with. Um, organizing our complex patient in an efficient way, risk stratification, and automatically lead to uh, suggestions that would be helpful for the clinician. So these, uh, this is divided, for, this is for a kidney transplant patient. Uh, with immunosuppression, um, cardiovascular disease, behavioral management, and chronic kidney disease all being summarized in this uh, form from the electronic medical record, and then risk, current therapy, suggested actions, and uh, the provider response uh, also on the same, uh, same form with uh, relatively easy to understand color coding that uh, identifies places that are in trouble in red, things that uh, are okay but cautionary in yellow and green uh, for things that are, that are fine. And so uh, we are implementing, uh, there's, there's data outside of the EMR, there's still some manual input, uh, and we are working on fixing the adherence. And so, um, the pharmacokinetic data, the adherence, the protocol recommended drug levels, uh, and the uh, passively reported patient outcomes are now being put in the same place and hopefully incorporated into this. And within the year, we hope that uh, this additional information will be available. And so we'd have adherence, rejection, survival, and cost all uh, summarized in one place for quick and easy action. And so uh, including social networking and smartphone apps that uh, we hope to uh, bring to the table and then apply this same strategic approach to other conditions. So that's basically our uh, genetic pharmacology service. I'll turn my attention to our clinical services. Uh, we do these tests at the moment um, and uh, they're examples of, uh, of how they're useful for a whole variety of different uh, conditions. There are 60 human uh, sequencing genetic tests offered at the moment that use basically Sanger sequencing. Um, we are converting these to next generation sequencing, and these are the first two that are being used uh, using a targeted sequencing approach. Um, and so the strategy is to take the testing that we're now doing by Sanger sequencing do that with next generation targeted sequencing. We confirm all results by, that we report uh, by Sanger sequencing and uh, then take the, there are 21 tests that are in the pipeline for being brought into targeted sequencing um, and they're listed on this slide and the next, there's some three or 400 genes that are involved um, in, uh, in all of these. So we expect that whole exome sequencing, or whole genome sequencing for that matter, will become inexpensive enough that it'll replace the targeted sequencing and that we will be moving eventually to, to uh, whole exome sequencing on just the basis of cost. We expect that the uh, next generation sequencing will, will finally become reliable enough that confirmation in the way that we're doing it now will not, will not be necessary. Uh, at some future time. 
when we do do the whole genome, it opens up the possibility that we can query the rest of the, the genome, for especially for those patients in which things uh, are not, uh, where we don't find the answer with the targeted sequencing, even when the clinician asks for a particular kind of syndrome. And then, of course, we have to cope with the incidental results, and we will wave our arms and say we'll follow the best practices at that time. <laughs> Uh, my personal orientation is that we should be returning as many results as we can, uh, but uh, that is not shared. We have the experience with the uh, patients with Huntington's disease that initially really would like 80% or 85 or 90% of them say they'd like to have the results returned. They go home, talk to their relatives, and they come back, and it drops to something like 15% that want to know the results. So. When you're bringing a new technology into the clinic, there's that issue about uh, discovery versus clinical utility. And so as a children's tertiary quaternary referral center, we see a lot of unusual pediatric conditions. And so we built the pipeline to do whole, whole exome sequencing. And at this point, and, and we're doing it on a semi-research basis, um, uh, we have a we have CLIA-approved uh, pipeline, but we haven't set up the, re, the uh, financing yet to do other things. So it's driven, as Mark mentioned the other day, by the interest of the faculty. And so we've done about 366 subjects, and we do trios in order to have reliable data and know what the de novo mutations are. I'll mention this condition. This is uh, barretster winter syndrome. 18 of 18 children known with this have de novo mutations in one, in, in one of two genes. And uh, they have this intellectual disability, hearing loss, seizure, short stature, uh, microcephaly, uh, and uh, this technology is going to be available for all kinds of uh, rare problems. Since Mark is holding up my, his hand, I'll just mention that uh, what we're hoping to do is to develop this pipeline and use it in an iterative improvement uh, way that incorporates gen genetic counseling, technical capacity, informatics, the interpretation, and the financing in ways that uh, will make this work as a clinical test for us going forward. We would probably begin with intellectual disability in children. That is the condition that, for which the literature supports the, uh, the, the greatest uh, uh, confidence that you'll find a, a de novo mutation and autism, and then we have many, many rare and un uncharacterized conditions. So we're, we're in the past, we have Sanger sequencing, and we're headed towards whole genome sequencing and other genomics. I expect that epigenetics, expression, metabolomics, uh, uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation, uh, chromatin confirmation experiments will all be important for clinical testing at some future time. I would just mention uh, as before, uh, the, uh, one of the speakers said that, well, we're becoming experts in particular fields, so you're not, a you're not a medical geneticist anymore. You're a cardiologist who's an expert in the genetics of cardiology. And I think my Howard here next to me was saying there was nobody in, in rheumatology at the meeting, and I was squirming in my seat because <laughs> that's what I do. And so, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> and so... This is a paper about the, uh, the uh, epigenome-wide association data looking at using that 450 array from Illumina and relating rheumatoid arthritis to the, um, uh, to the SNPs, to the single nucleotide polymorphisms that have been related to its risk. And they found eight or nine examples in a small subset using this approach called the, cas the causal interference test the causal inference test, excuse me, and putting differentially methylated sites in the middle, they find that they can go from the genetic origin through methylation that's different in cases and controls in a way that infers causation to the disease process, suggesting that the low uh, odds ratios that we have for GWASs can be improved by looking at these epigenetic uh, risks and combinations. And so, uh, uh, luckily for me, Terry is still up to two fingers, and so, and I'm at my last slide. 
Thank you, John. That was uh, that was great. Uh, just to, as the apologist for the group, uh, while uh, I think we all recognize uh, all of the exciting things um, that are coming, uh, our orientation has always been very practical, which is what is here that we can actually do something with. So I imagine we'll eventually get all of those things as, as uh, people that are involved in the foundational work to say where is the utility. We'll, we'll eventually be taking those on as well. Um, that's a certain amount of job security. Yeah, I think you'll have meetings to, to organize in the next couple of decades for yeah. this. So a couple <laughs> of questions. Um, uh, one is, uh, I wanted to go back to that uh, uh, kidney um, transplantation example that you used. Uh, two questions about that. One is, um, uh, are all the data that are collected as part of that form uh, then represented as structured data in the data warehouse? And then the second question, <laughs> Uh, related to that, as you mentioned, uh, uh, patient um, uh, uh, outcomes, uh, and are, what tools are you using to collect those, uh, uh, those patient reported outcomes? Uh, hmm. Well, I'm not certain. The, uh, uh, we were using all kinds of different measures of their hospitalization uh, time, the uh, time in therapy, the, the various tests for how their uh, psychiatric condition was progressing. So we were developing, we were interested in developing the preliminary data that would make a real test possible. Uh, so that's where we're stuck with that. The okay. psychiatric uh, practices vary greatly from practitioner to practitioner. Uh, drug selection as well as how they interact with patients and how the uh, uh, progress. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's really important because uh, you mentioned specifically, and it was nice to see passive patient outcomes and then patient reported outcomes. And I think we sometimes forget that those things are different. That how a doctor thinks a patient is doing and how the patient thinks the patient is doing are frequently at odds. And and clearly. Um, the movement is towards patient reported outcomes. And so I think as we th think about some of the implementation strategies, we want to be able to move to collect uh, patient reported data mm -hmm. um, uh, to get uh, to address that specific question and um, use where available standardized tools or where not available, uh, think about development of standardized tools that can be uh, used broadly. I think yeah. the, uh, I just mentioned that I think the re one of the reasons that the psychiatric pharmacogenomics is used so extensively is because the psychiatrists have now a whole slew of drugs to choose from, and they really don't know, have any idea which drug to pick. And so they're, they're kind of flopping around a bit to figure out which ones to start with and how to make that work and what little bit of help they can get. So it may not be that pharmacogenomics adds so much, it's just that they have so little to discriminate between the various choices that they have. To, yeah, this uh, gets make. exactly to what Ned is saying, that you know, identifying clinical contexts where, again, and you, you maybe have therapeutic equipoise or you have a number of things to select from, the barrier to use additional information like pharmacogenomics to inform your choice and then measure the outcomes uh, doesn't really add much in the way of risk. Uh, to that, um, but it may be very important in terms of the outcomes. And so this, it's a great, um, I've been really impressed uh, way back to 2004 when I first started hearing about the work, uh, about the opportunity that we have in an area that really is not being explored uh, uh, particularly well. And in fact, EGAP has gone on record as saying there is in fact uh, no reason uh, to, uh, to do a CYP2C19 testing, whereas I think you have data uh, that I've seen presented at least informally that would suggest that that probably is, a, is not the correct conclusion and we may have to revisit that. So we're looking forward to more. So Jeff. Yeah, I, I, I want to congratulate you also on the pharmacogenomics consultation model um, for neuropsychiatric um, medications. And I, the fact that it's been around, I don't know how many years, Mark said 2004, so quite a long time, suggests that you've figured out a sustainable economic model for that to work and could you comment on on that uh, model? I, I think our reimbursement rate for that is about the same as it is overall, about 60 percent. So we think we're doing pretty well with it. So how is that? Uh, is that being uh, billed then as a, as a separate professional service through like a uh, farm D type of a... Uh, uh, I th uh, I'm not certain, but I think it's b billed as the test is billed separately from the consultation service. And so the test and its automatic report comes back and uh, that's billed separately. And if you want a full consultation, then that uh, comes from the, 
pharmacogenomics testing service. Okay, great. Um, so we will take a break. Uh, we're going to uh, short. No, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Maureen. Help. John, I just wondered um, along the same lines if you looked at um, whether there was any difference for the physician in terms of length of time they spent with the patient? No. I mean, whether these are. Uh, whether that extended their time in terms of having to explain things or talk to the patient with having the pharmacogenetic testing, or they felt that maybe it was more efficient? Uh, that kind of randomized control trial, which we would like to do, hasn't been done. <laughs> Thanks. Any other? Okay. Um, so we will take a break. Uh, again, I think in, uh, to be sensitive to people's time, we will uh, do it for 20 minutes, uh, meaning we'll reconvene about uh, 10 to. Thank you.